remember of course you do remember you. you're the biggest you're the biggest fan you know like one minute one minute and second <laughs> Banzai, I'm the Cobra Kai Kid, and today I am joined by the music editor of Cobra Kai, Andres Loxy. Andres, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for uh, having me. Oh, uh, no, thank you for coming on. Um, this is really exciting. I am a huge fan of the music of Cobra Kai. Absolutely love it. Um, getting to talk to Zach and Leo and then find out, like, you know, I'm just starting to learn, like, you know, when I interviewed them, I mean, it must have been like three, four years ago, which is crazy. That's when I first started to learn, like, how much goes into it and how many different roles there are. And now discovering a music editor, you know, very big role uh, on any show, any movie. Can you tell everyone out there um, what it is a music editor does and what your role is? Sure. Yeah. So being a music editor uh, means I have to work with composers a lot. I'm part of the composers team. So I deal with any music that they write and also any music that's licensed for a show or for a movie. That means any song. Um, so if you hear a song on Cobra Kai, uh, many times it has been edited by me so that it fits the the video, you know, you they'll send me like a large uh, scene and the song is like either too short or too long and I have to make it work. I also have to pick the best bits and pieces of the song so that you hit moments on screen. Uh, I do that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I guess generally speaking, I'm kind of the middleman or like li liaison between the film editor and the composers. So I'm kind of the music wrangler where everything that's music has to go through me and then I give it to the film editor uh, so that they can incorporate it into the uh, show. I also present any music to the showrunners. Um, and then I also deliver the music to the stage. The stage is the this room that kind of looks like a big... Uh, screening room or like a big movie theater basically but uh rather than just sitting and, and listening to it as part of like an audience member you work in that room and you mix all the music you make the music uh balanced so that you always hear the dialogue and when there's music you kind of make the music louder or softer depending on things and you pan everything you put everything where it should be on the on the uh stereo field or i guess in this case surround field um and I'm delivering the music to those guys uh, that mix the, the, the sound. And I'm also the last person that can change the music before it's properly done. Uh, as you may have talked with, um, with Zach and Leo, they might have told you that in Cobra Kai we have live orchestra. So once uh, the orchestra is recorded, the music only exists as audio. Uh, before then, it can exist as something called MIDI or as like a demo where you can change things and it's still not recorded with real instruments. It might be like uh, synthesizers and uh, I guess sampled instruments in the computer. But once we record it, it, it kind of is what it is. And if there are any changes that need to be done at the final stage of the, of the, um, the mixing, then it's up to me to edit the audio to make any changes. And that's something I do like at the end of a project. Um, I also do stuff that is not as interesting, but has to be done. One of those things is called a music cue sheet where I list every single piece of music that was used in every episode of a season. And I, I write down who wrote it, uh, how long is it? Does it have any vocals? Is it just instrumental? Does it play over the uh, main title card when you see like Cobra Kai? <laughs> yeah. Or if, um, if it plays in the end credits, because every one of those uses will uh, make a difference in how the royalty payments are made. So something that plays over end credits uh, pays more 
because it's like they consider it like a more featured moment of the music. Uh, and that's just like a document that I do at the end of a project. Um, one of the things I do, which is very cool and a, a very creative part of my job is before an episode gets to Zach and Leo, uh, I add temporary music. We call it temp. Mm -hmm. So they'll send me a scene from the cutting room, um, that might have a little bit of music or none at all. And, uh, I add music either from Cobra Kai most of the time, or if it's something really new from some other score. Like I remember when we first had Terry Silver, uh, we didn't have any music at all because he was like this, not a new character, but in, in the show, it was a new character, but we had to add music that hadn't been established yet. So for that, I remember using music from other moments. Like I used some 80s, uh, like Jean-Claude Van Damme uh, movie, of <laughs> course, some like dark synth type of stuff. Uh, Zach suggested some cool stuff from like synth wave music. And, uh, I add some, some music to like a blank slate, just the, the, the actors, you know, with no music at all. And then I send that to the showrunners. They look at it. They say, it's good. It's not good. What works, what doesn't until we arrive at a place where everybody thinks this music kind of works already, but we're going to have Zach and Leo do their own thing with uh new original themes but maybe the shape is there you know you know where the music will start when there's a shift if there's like a big ending at the end i kind of have like a little bit of a blueprint for um for zach and leo and for anybody that needs to see the the video at an early stage they might send it to uh some some other uh, executive to see and it might have the temporary music uh in there that's i guess kind of in, in general terms everything that i do i'm kind of like a i, I guess I, I do a little bit of everything music wise for post-production that is super interesting and it's like is your Okay, so you do a bit of everything, but the, the the main like role, like the title of it is music editor, or is there any other like roles that you would say you're doing or it does that role pretty much cover it all? It would be just music editor. Yeah, that's what I what I call myself. That's the job. And uh, of course, the main bulk of the job is editing the music, be it the temp music, uh, the original composer's music or the licensed songs. I'm editing the music so that it works with a video that, as you may know, when you're working on a TV show or a film, the video is constantly changing. So even if uh, Zach and Leo write a piece, maybe they wrote it to a picture that was not the final video. So they'll, they'll keep editing it. And then we get to the stage and maybe the scene is like 10 seconds shorter. So I have to see how they read it wrote the how they wrote the music to the to the first draft of the video i have to see what changed maybe they made a reaction shot of like crease a little bit shorter and i have to make an edit and make it work so that the audience doesn't know there's an edit and it still works musically so yeah i'm i'm editing but i'm also doing a lot of little things yeah. so when you're editing the music and like yeah like an example like you brought up where um, oh, there's an extra reaction shot. We need to cut down the music. Do you have access to all the like instrument files like that where you yeah. can like kind of play like play around with it and kind of like adjust it in that sense, like take out a, two beats or something? For sure. Yeah, yeah. So in the, in that case, like you said, maybe they maybe they removed a reaction shot and then the the scene is shorter. Uh, and uh, I would have the music in something called stems, which is in like record world, it would be like a multi-track where you have the drums. Um, I guess multi-track would be like kick, snare. Like I don't go that specific, but I do have like a drum track. I have the bass, I have the guitars, I have the synths, I have a miscellaneous. Miscellaneous would be maybe like the uh, karate 
uh, shouts that keep yeah. and stuff <laughs> that, that, would go, that would go in the miscellaneous part of the songs, uh, right? Yeah. So yeah. I would have the every um, element of the music would be its own track, so that if I have to make a, a an edit, uh, I'm able to mute certain things or like um, get into difficult places in the music by being able to isolate certain things. I might do an edit a little bit early, a little bit earlier on the drums little bit later on the melody maybe once the melody is ending i can go to the end of that and then cut there uh yeah i can do that with songs it's a little bit more different uh more difficult because most songs will not have stems uh especially if it's an older song they didn't go to a studio and request that the band deliver every element separately uh, like on a Queen song, for example, we might only have the stereo track that has everything and maybe a version that's just the instrumental. So everything except the vocals. So then my job is more difficult because I have to really do like hard edits there. Uh, if I had like access to all the vocals separately, and all the instruments separately on a song, it would be way easier, like like with score. That's really interesting. So if you could describe your job in three adjectives, what adjectives would you describe it? Uh, I would say creative would be one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say stressful, but it doesn't have to be stressful if you can manage it. But many times at the stage, like I said, when when it's like the last moment where you can change something, there is a lot of pressure that uh, from everybody so that it's like it's done well. Because once it's dubbed, once it's mixed, you really can't change it unless you go back in and you schedule another day and have to pay all this room full of professionals to redo it. So yeah, stressful would be the second one. And uh, let's see, what we, it's not an adjective. What would, what would an adjective be to describe something where you have to be very organized? I guess you could say... Um, Efficient? uh not really not no <laughs> i see what you're going but hmm organized <laughs> organized i guess so yeah 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 but it's also fun fun would be the third one yeah 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 it's a it's a fun gig but it can be stressful and it can be creative sometimes and sometimes not as creative but yeah it it sounds like it is really challenging but it makes it even better when it when you accomplish it right mm -hmm. like like what it, what is that what is that feeling like you know after like you know you take like you have a piece of music and you are able to edit it and then like you you finish that like what is that feeling like for you absolutely i think that might be like the one of the most fulfilling parts of my job i'll give you a, a like a really specific example do you remember the um that scene, I think it might have been season two or three. I forget. It's been a while. But where uh, Cobra Kai and Johnny Lawrence kind of crash the karate, the, the Miyagi-Do presentation. Yeah, season two, episode three, yeah, Fire Nice. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So you remember that song, It's Airborne, which is the, the really cool, badass uh, 80s-style rock band from Australia, yeah. I think. Uh, they gave me that scene to to find a song and edit it. And, uh, that was the song that I, I think I, I edited that based on something that they had put in there, but as it, it wasn't quite working well enough. And I remember there's a moment there where, uh, they light up some like concrete blocks on yeah. fire. That's, <laughs> that's a great moment. And you'll see that the song, if you, if you watch it again and you listen carefully, uh, I restarted the song. The song won't won't mm. do that on its own. But I remember the start of the song was so epic 
and it felt like there was a little bit of a pause in the scene in the scene mm -hmm. and then when he breaks the concrete blocks it kind of starts again full throttle and i remember finding that it's kind of like my job can be a, a little bit like um like problem solving or like finding like a, a solution to a puzzle and when i saw how well it worked to restart it there i said okay i think i cracked the code this is gonna work and uh, everybody really liked that, including me. So it's it's really cool finding those moments where you're like, yes, this really works. This is awesome. I've watched the show so many times. I know exactly <laughs> what you were talking about, like exactly. Yeah. And yeah, I think it works because yeah, it, it's all this action, action, action. And then it's kind of like, like everything stops. They light up the the concrete and Johnny's like, okay, everyone, like, you know, like, give me my space. And then you start up. Da, 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 yeah. da, da, da. So good. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I I also have to ask you, like, that that just made me think of um, Zach and Leo revealed to me, and I thought this was a, the coolest thing. Um, I'm glad it didn't. I'm glad um, with the final product and what you guys ended up going with. But can you talk about? The finale of season two, the school fight, yes. originally was going to be Welcome to the Jungle by Guns N' Roses. Can you talk about that and that whole yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was tough because I think the first thing they had me do is try to do an edit with Guns N' Roses that's going to work. And I love the song. Guns N' Roses is really badass. And it, I think it would have worked. But the problem is the scene is so long. <laughs> that we had to, I think the edit was like 2.5 or more times the whole length of Welcome to the Jungle. And at some point, it doesn't matter how cool a song is or how cool the scene is. If you listen to it two and a half times, it kind of just loses momentum. And we all kind of realized that after I edited the song that it, it just wasn't going to work. Also... I think the song was one of the most expensive songs to license we've ever seen. I don't remember exactly how much it was, but don't quote me on this, but it might have been like $100,000 or something crazy. So they're like, no, 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 it's really expensive. And also it just kind of feel like it drags because it's just too long. And then uh, Zach and Leo did their own thing and it was like incredible. So it was good. It was a good experiment to try and see how it would have been but it, it's good that they did the original yeah and i think that's one of the best scores of the show so i think it nice, it yeah. worked and 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 yeah i i understand that i think they said i remember when talking to them the first 30 seconds of it were um, like sounded cool but then yeah after that it kind of gets repetitive yeah like yeah. you just yeah it's the same thing totally, um totally what was it like mixing the music for that school fight because like you know that was a long fight scene with so many different themes and elements i mean like you literally had every like style and every like like certain themes pop up do you remember that i know that was um a, a couple years ago yeah no i do remember it it was it was <laughs> really loud for a, <laughs> for a long time man it was really really difficult uh to mix it was uh i remember so Joe DeAngelis and Chris Carpenter are the mixers on the show. They're incredible. Uh, usually at the stage, it's uh, the two mixers. It's uh, Patrick Hogan, the the sound uh, supervisor. Yeah. And uh, it's um, it's Mallory Young and the three showrunners. And uh, we have the record is there. And everybody was like, we need a little bit of a break because it's just been like nonstop <laughs> loudness for five hours. It was really difficult just on, on that alone, just the loudness for so such a long time. But uh, not only that, it was difficult to balance everything because I think you remember there's like dialogue and this person will say this and then this person will say that and you have this like really strong um, rock and also all the sound effects and to be able to dig out every one of those elements and have it still be impactful was difficult and they did a really really good job the mixers just pulled it off really well 
and the timing of that music like there were so many music moments that hit certain parts uh one part that stands out to me in particular is uh when you know hawk is going crazy in the hallway oh, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. he gets punched in the face and everything kind of stops and then it like goes back in right into like quiver like yeah. but however you did that was yeah. sick the timing of that like crazy it was cool man yeah i really like that that uh that whole sequence it's it's awesome. It's one of the, the best moments in the show, I think. I agree with you. Definitely. And, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll get back into Cobra Kai, but I do mm -hmm. want to ask you about Obliterated. So, yeah. at the time of releasing this interview, Obliterated will be out. So, Whoa. everyone could go check it out on awesome. Netflix. Um, obviously, we're not going to give any spoilers for those yeah. who haven't watched but I want to ask you, you know, working on this series as a mu music editor, yeah. um, you know, you worked on Cobra Kai with John, Josh and Hayden and Zach and Leo. And, you know, it's a lot of the same people, but now this yeah. brand new show. So what is it like putting this show out to the world? And what are you like most excited for fans to hear about this music in particular? Yeah, it's awesome. This one, uh, I loved working on it it was very challenging it was kind of like a like a season one of cobra kai where or, or season one of any show for me where the music the themes haven't been established and it's kind of this blank slate musically and that's where i have to work the hardest because i have to find music uh for something that doesn't exist yet so like for example on a on a season you know five season six cobra kai I'm I'm I have five seasons worth of music to temp. So if I see Daniel I, and it could be any kind of Daniel, it could be like tournament Daniel, it could be uh, nostalgic Daniel Miyagi Do Daniel, it could be Daniel Sam, it could be Daniel Johnny. Every one of those moments has themes, and I have maybe four or five versions of one cue that could work, and it's very easy for me especially since I know the show so well, to just go into my library and pick something and throw it in and, and edit it and it'll seem like it was done for the show. But on Obliterated, none of that existed. So I have to look for scores in mainly movies to f try and find something that would work for this brand new universe and all new characters. And uh, it was it was difficult, but it was cool. And the music is super, super, it's different, very different to Cobra Kai. And it's really badass. You'll see. I can't give away too much, but you'll see it. You said this is going to be out by the time that is out. So hopefully if you have, whoever hasn't seen it, you should see it. It is really exciting. It's very fun. Um, and it's unique. Yeah, I can't say too much more. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's it's okay. It's okay. I, I I hope everyone could go check it out and listen. And yeah. um, I think that's really exciting that it's going to have a different, you know, the same people working on the music, but different styles. I'm excited. So yeah, man. Um, I do want to ask you, how did this all come to be? What made you want to become a music editor? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a little bit of a long long uh <laughs> answer but let me try and not do it as long so uh -huh. i went to a study at a place called berkeley college of music many years ago and i was playing gu guitar mainly flamenco guitar i went to berkeley because berkeley was the only place in the world at that time where you could audition playing whatever style and whatever instrument you wanted it was either that or if you wanted to have a major in performance and like guitar performance, it would have to be classical uh, music, right? But Berkeley said, you can play whatever you want, just come over and do it. So I went over there, I played flamenco guitar. I got in, I was excited. And then I got my list of classes after I told them I played flamenco and wanted to play flamenco. And they put me in the like the R&B ensemble. I'm like, what? I've never <laughs> played R&B in my life. I don't have an electric guitar. I had to go buy an electric guitar. And uh, I remember being forced to play styles of music that weren't the music that I liked. Wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. And it made me really change my whole perspective on 
what it would be like to be a, a, a session musician in LA. Cause that's kind of what I thought it would become. One of the guys that plays on like, for example, Zach and Leo's stuff, mm -hmm. they hire a guy that's like an incredible musician and it doesn't matter what style of music that they put in front of him on like the score, they would perform it and they do it amazingly. Like in this case, uh, Andrew on Cobra Kai, he's incredible. Yeah. Um, but for me, I saw how difficult that would be. And also if I didn't really like the music I was playing, it felt like a real, like a true job and not as fun for me. So I kind of changed careers midway. I did dual majors there. It was guitar and also music production and engineering. So more recording music, mixing music, uh, producing music, doing a lot of Pro Tools work. Pro Tools is the the uh, the software that we use for post production audio, either, either mixing or, or mastering or recording. It's or editing. It's in Pro Tools. So I learned Pro Tools really well. Um, and then I thought, when I go to LA, maybe I'm gonna do a um, maybe I'm going to work on recording or mixing music for, for movies because I've always really liked movies. Uh, at Berkeley, I was roommates with a good friend of mine from Mexico. His name is Juan Carlos en Enriquez. Shout out to Juan Carlos, also a really great composer. And uh, for one of the projects, I recorded a, a, like three cues. Cues is the name of a of a piece for film or for or for TV. And instead of calling something a song or a piece, we we call it a cue, a music cue. Mm. So we record we recorded three cues of his music. I recorded it, I mixed it, and everything with a live orchestra at Berkeley. And uh, I moved to LA thinking that's what I was going to do. Um, I got a job assisting a composer uh, like nine years ago or ten years ago. Uh, Phil Eisler is his name. He worked on a show called Revenge many years ago and then a show called Empire about the music business. Um, and working for Phil, I got to go to a lot of live orchestral sessions in L.A. We went to Capitol Records a lot. We went to Warner Brothers and I got to see a, like a huge orchestra play uh, live um, TV music. And I thought that was incredible. Uh, however, I remember, um, my time, I remembered my time at Berkeley recording and mixing music for records, and it felt very different to recording music for TV. For records, it felt more like there was a lot of room to, uh, do creative, crazy decisions, but in the style of music we were doing for, for my boss, it was more like classical style orchestral writing. And I remember we went to like the first session of the season and we set up this, this, uh, orchestra and we got it pristine and, and the engineer made it sound beautiful and everything. And then after that, we didn't change anything at all for five years or something mm. like that. I was only there for like three, but the whole season that was a setup, that was a sound and that was it. And you don't change it. And for me, it felt like I wanted something that where I could just do a lot more changes or creative decisions. It, it something about just recording something and making it sound pristine and then not doing too many changes. It felt like it wasn't the right fit for me. But at the same time, I got to meet uh, Josh Winget, the music editor that worked for Phil. And I said, whoa, this sounds like something I would really like to do because he had to uh, many times, uh, reutilize music, kind of like recycle, I guess, cues from one scene and put them in another scene or then like, uh, grab a hip hop piece and cut it so that it seems like it was made for a montage or something like that. And that felt really, really interesting to me seeing Phil's music editor, uh, work. And I said, I think this is what I want to do. Um, but music editing is a, is a union job. It's a Yahtzee. And I wasn't in the union yet because composers, as you may or may not know, don't have a union. And uh, I had to get in the union first to be able to work as a music editor. But then just pure chance, one of my friends from Berkeley, uh, who's an awesome dialogue editor and recordist now, she records... Um, 
ADR and uh, voiceover. She told me back then, this is like eight years ago, uh, hey, the studio where I'm working at, um, three of the engineers are leaving. Would you like to come over and help? And I said, whoa, I would be doing something that has nothing to do with music, but it would let me get into the union eventually. So mm -hmm. I made a really big decision to stop working on music for TV with Phil. And I went to the studio called Anifex, which is now long gone. It closed. Uh, and I was doing kind of assistant editor stuff. So I was able to learn a lot about everything post that is not music, post sound. I learned a little bit of dialogue editing. I learned a little bit of sound effects editing, a little bit of Foley of the walking part and of the editing part as well. And a lot of uh, just like organizing sound and assets and that kind of thing. And I think it helped me a lot too, because in my job, it feels like a, like a really big hybrid between post-production audio and knowing all that world and being able to communicate with people like Patrick and Joe and Chris at the stage that do a lot more audio. Uh, and then with composers, uh, I'm kind of the in-between guy that has to know both. So after a few months, I was able to join the union. Then the studio closed and it kind of forced me to then think what I was going to do. I said, well, I'm in the union now. I'm not doing music editing, but do I want to keep doing dialogue like what I was doing at NFX or should I do music editing? And I thought this is kind of the perfect moment to go back to what I wanted to do. And I eventually started working for a music editor kind of as his assistant. And then like one or two years after that, uh, I worked on Cobra Kai after meeting uh, Zach and Leo. And I have been kind of doing more of my own things rather than working for a music editor. I became the, ma the, main, the main and only, I think, music editor on, on their shows. Uh, and that's it. I told you it was a long answer. To <laughs> There's your answer. And I could expand more on like how I met Zach and Leo, which is a cool story, but I don't know if you want to. I, that actually, that was what I was going to ask you next. Oh, okay, if you cool. wouldn't mind sharing, I'd yeah, love yeah, yeah. to know that story. No problem. It's a funny story, man. Yeah. So I was, uh, so my wife works at, at LACMA, the big museum here in, in LA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And uh, she invited me to a party that one of her coworkers was hosting. And uh, I remember getting there and I think it was just like me and one other dude and everybody else was women there. And uh, so I naturally just went over to the other dude there is like, hey, man, what's up? It looks like we're the only guys here. It's like, yeah, yeah. We started joking around, seemed like a really, really great guy. And uh, eventually, you know, we got to the point of the conversation where he was like, hey, so do you do you live and work here? I said, yeah, yeah. I'm from Mexico originally, but I've moved here, you know, a few years ago and I'm a music editor. And he said, whoa, really? You're a music editor? I said, yeah. He's like, I'm a composer. I said, whoa, that's crazy. What a coincidence. <laughs> it's like, that's nuts. And both of our wives work at LACMA. And uh, we just, we didn't really get too much more into work stuff. We just were hanging out. Um, and then at the end of the party, he said, hey, would you mind giving me your phone number? Because a couple of friends of mine are looking for a music editor like right now. I said, sure, why not? And I thought nothing was going to come out of it because most of the times when, when I've given my info to someone, like nothing happens. But I think the next day I get a text from uh, Zach and Leo that said, hey, uh, our buddy, uh, Jeff Morrow, who's an awesome composer, by the way, you should check him out. Jeff is, is badass. He said, Jeff sent us your, your contact info. Would you like to meet? I said, sure. And then we, uh, we met at a coffee shop called paper and plastic here on Pico. And, uh, the first surprise was like, whoa, these dudes are my age, which is like very, very strange in this world. Like Jeff too. It, uh, for some reason, now there's more, there's more young guys, but maybe 10 years ago, 
it was it mainly all the music editors were like these older guys. Mm -hmm. So for them, it was very rare to have a music editor that's the guy their age. So we just got along really, really well. And they pitched Cobra Kai to me. They said, hey, we're going to be working on this YouTube show. That's a sequel of the Karate Kid. And I'm thinking, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's, that's wild. I, I said, sure, because I... I like really, really love the Karate Kid from like since forever. Um, I was telling Zach and Leo in our meeting that uh, I remember watching Karate Kid as a kid myself in Mexico in Guadalajara because our in Mexico in general, not anymore, but back when I was a kid, we would get TV shows and movies like 10 years after they were released. It was oh, like gosh. a really, really slow trickling. It was prior to streaming, so you just mm. put the TV on and see what's on. And uh, so I watched all all the Karate Kid movies as a kid, um, just on on network TV, and I loved it ever since. So it was like, yes, of course, I want to work on something that's the Karate Kid related, <laughs> of course. Um, but it did feel really strange <laughs> where they were saying it's going to be a YouTube show and it's a sequel and it's going to be comedy, <laughs> yeah. but Hey, like what an original great idea. And like it, it became this huge hit. So yeah, I met them since season one and I've worked on pretty much everything that they've done where they can hire a music editor. We've worked together. That's so cool. And I, I, I love how you mentioned that, like, when, when you were first pitched it, it did seem strange to you. Because I have to be honest, you know, if I if I heard that too, you know, oh, continuing the Karate Kid, but it's a TV series on YouTube, and it's a comedy, and we're bringing back the original people, and it's going to be similar but different, but this, it, and, and the guys from Harold and Kumar are going to work on it. It's like, wait, what is this project? Yeah. When did it? hit you because like i'm sure you know hearing it is like okay this sounds maybe interesting but when did it hit you like oh wow this is good like i'm working on something really special honestly immediately we went to we went to the uh to the spotting session and i saw and i was like oh my god this is incredible like they really are doing something unique and and something really good and this is something that I tell everybody about when I'm talking about Cobra Kai. It is made with so much respect towards the original material that like, how could it be bad when they care and love about the, the Karate Kid so much? Like mm -hmm. it, I tell everybody, like, I wish all of the Hollywood sequels that have been done since were done with so much respect towards the original material, because like, these guys like it doesn't matter uh like how little or how much like money you're putting into it when it's when it's done with so much respect you end up with something really good um and yeah it hit me immediately it was like yeah this is amazing i remember especially the the montage of uh johnny driving drunk driving at night it's my favorite scene of the whole show of the yeah, whole show. Yeah, it's incredible. And I I was seeing that and I was like, whoa, this is so good. So, so good. The way they they introduce the flashbacks is so organic. Uh so yeah, hats off to the to the I mean, obviously they know this, but I like respect and admire Don, Josh, and Hayden so much. They they did like an incredible, incredible show. Yeah. For sure. Can I ask you a question about that scene in particular? Yeah. Cause like like now that you brought it up, like I mean I'm sure if we if we were to go through every song in the show, I could just ask you so many questions. But uh, sure of of from that scene, something really cool, and I, I'm I'm sure you're like you know there there's certain times where you do this, and I, it's just it's a little thing, but it's just so interesting. It's the song Head Games by Foreigner, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know it, when Johnny when Johnny throws the the um the the bottle like the you know his his drink at the tv and then gets in the car he turns on the radio and the music starts and it's yeah. like it, it it's it's coming from the radio but it's loud and it, it it sounds like it's just like a soundtrack put in but then when johnny pulls up to the all valley tournament arena 
Mm -hmm. then you change it where you have the music like kind of muffled coming from the car yeah can you, talk, totally, can, you talk, totally. can you talk about that that's pretty cool yeah for sure i do that all the time um in montages it's kind of like a classic thing to do where we go from from a, a piece of music sounding like score so very much like uh, emotions. It's loud and clear. It's not meant to be playing from a stereo or nobody singing it live or anything. We, we we say it sounds like score. And then it sounds like source music when it's coming out of a radio, coming out of like a, uh, a speaker somewhere. So in that we go from score to source. And the way you do that in a very technical way is that you have to pick a moment and then you have to analyze how much time do I want to go for for us to like transition from this that big sound to that like really small sound it can be done many ways it can be dragged out so that it's very smooth and eventually you get to it and it's kind of like they take you there by the hand or it can be really drastic i've done that sometimes where you're in this like really big space and then suddenly snap you cut to the radio and you're like oh it was coming out of this car radio all of a sudden and uh, the way you do that is you have your your track with the with the full uh, sounding uh, piece of music, and then a second track. And it's very easy. It's basically you pick a, mo a way to to fade it, and then a way to fade it in. And where and how much of a fade and what kind of mm -hmm. fade you do kind of dictates how much time you have to transition to the new new sound. And then I kind of for when we're sending that for preview to the showrunners or to the studio and the network, I have to make my own version of what it would sound like coming out of a car. But then what you hear on the TV show is done by the mixers. They pick with their really fancy, cool tools and their, their mixing board. They can uh, decide how, how wide they're going to do it, how muffled, what kind of uh, reverb they're going to do on the car and uh, they put that in into the mix. So it's kind of a team effort where I'm mainly about timing. How do we get there? How fast? How uh, how short of a fade? How long? And then they pick what space to put it in. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And another thing, um, first off, with the music, do you pick out do you have a role of picking out the songs that are actually used? Is that your job? So it's that would be the music supervisor's role. She mm -hmm. would pick, I, I said she, because in this case, it's uh, Michelle Johnson. She's off, awesome. Super good supervisor. Uh, she, uh, it, it's mainly the music supervisor's job to, to, to find the songs. And, um, it's both a creative decision and also a money decision. It's a financial thing because every song will cost a different amount. So she has to look at budgets and see how much are we going to allocate to this scene? How much to this scene? How much to this scene? So many times she will give me a batch of maybe eight songs. And then she will say, pick whatever one you think is the best, but maybe let's either edit all of them or just pick the three best or the four best out of the batch. And then I have to go in and I have to edit many times all of them. Uh, even if I think one is better than the other, I'll still do all because of course uh, it's not up to me to decide what's gonna end up there. I'm kind of just the hired gun to provide the showrunners all the options they, they can, and I'll make every song work as well as possible, but then it's up to them because it's their show and it's their creative decision to pick what they want to go in the show. So it would be interesting also uh, for you, I guess, since you're such a big fan, for me to show you on your like favorite scenes in the show, all the options that didn't make it, because there were some really good options in other scenes where... Uh, there there's like other five songs that could have gone in there but they picked something else yeah i know uh thunderstruck was a song right that you guys yeah. wanted yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and do you remember the joke i i thought it was you you probably appreciate this as someone who's like in the business in season two uh johnny when 
uh, he's like, you know, making the commercial for Cobra Kai. He tells Aisha, throw some sh- Thunderstruck yeah, under yeah, it. Yeah, and yeah, Aisha's yeah. like, Sensei, I think the rights are too expensive. And he's like, no, I have the cassette in my car. <laughs> yeah, man, that's a great, that's a great joke. You must have loved yeah. that. Like, <laughs> because yeah, it's true. It. It, it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, like, yeah, I've got it. <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> so I'm curious because, you know, you're working with so many great songs and also like Zach and Leo are sending you these like incredible pieces of music. But obviously, you know, it's like a- a- as good as the pieces are, you have to edit it to fit the scene and to fit the show. Like where the whole track might sound good on a soundtrack, but it just might not fit for the scene so how do you maintain the like the integrity of the song but also make those necessary edits for the show for sure yeah that's a it's a difficult thing to do um if it's a really popular song you kind of have to go with with a little bit of like i guess you maybe i don't know i don't want to sound rude by saying common sense but it's more of like a general understanding of what it is what what is it that people like and recognize about the song so if you have um let's say we will rock you you're not gonna start the song midway through the song because yeah. people recognize the intro so you know so much that you want to have the intro there. You can't um, omit things that people really really like uh, when you're cutting a famous song. The way you get around that is is it, this is more of like insider music editor tips, which any music editor will probably tell you the same thing. But if you have a really iconic song. And the verse is repeated twice and you need less space, you can get rid of one of the repetitions. Um, but yeah, you want it, it's it's difficult, and every song will have its own way of of doing things because every song is slightly different. But uh you want to keep an iconic guitar solo that everybody recognizes, you know, like uh Maybe if it's a Led Zeppelin track and you have a really famous riff, you don't want to get rid of the riff that everybody likes. It might have been the sole reason why they picked the song because of like a really famous guitar riff. So you want to recognize those things. And you also want to recognize the most important or important moments on a on a on a sequence. And uh, you want to select those pieces, those parts to play to play exactly where those things happen. Um, I remember there's a, help, help me since you're such a big fan. I don't remember (laughs) what season it is, but the super sad moment where we have the body bag moment and the queen song. And I was, I swear to you, while you were giving your answer, I was thinking of that. Uh, the show must go on from season two. I was literally thinking of that song with the guitar solo. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's, that's what I was thinking. Like. I have to look at a scene and say, like, what is it? What is the scene trying to do? Even if there's no song, like, what is it? What is the story here? And then finding a story in the music. Like my job, I think the most, uh, the coolest part and the most difficult part of my job is understanding music well enough that you can kind of create a story or understand what the music is trying to tell you and how to enhance a scene with the story the music itself is telling you. And if you recognize those elements, like those powerful moments with the guitar etc and you cut to this moment like this really dramatic thing it's like okay what am i gonna place here and if you have three or four of those already then it's a puzzle of how do you get from a to b to c to d and still have it sound transparent and so that people won't tell that it's been chopped up that's kind of the 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 key um so that when you're seeing and hearing it, it doesn't take you out of a scene where, and with like famous songs, it's really difficult because people know the song so well that if they yeah. know that the song has been chopped up, it might take you out of the scene where you're now thinking about the music rather than than the scene. So you have to be almost like a magician where a good music edit is a music edit that you, you can't hear. Um, 
I kind of went out of topic a little bit, but not so much, I guess. Yeah. No, one, I 100% understand what you're saying. And a lot of music I uh, discovered from Cobra Kai. So it is interesting listening to the full version. I'm like, wait, that's how the song goes. <laughs> it's like, because yeah. it's like, there's an extra verse here. And it's like, it, it's pretty cool. So. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's usually me. Uh, sometimes it's the um, the film editor too. For really, really iconic moments for head games, I remember not choosing that myself. I think it was the showrunners and Nick, the editor. They picked that song, and then and then it was me kind of finessing the edits uh, and doing like the transferring from score to source, that kind of stuff. Maybe finding an, an ending for it, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I remember he picked that and I thought it was incredible. There's been other moments where I have picked something and everybody liked it and it was cool. Um, there have been other places where the music supervisor picked something and like, she nailed it. You'll see, um, I won't get into any details, but, uh, maybe we can talk later after obliterated has been released, but there were some like incredible choices from Michelle that made it where she picked a song and it was like whoa this was like exactly what needed to go in there uh you'll see it has it has good stuff there's really really great stuff in that show i know you can't give anything away but would you say there's at least one song that like people will recognize oh absolutely yeah 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 okay cool cool i'm excited i'm excited yeah yeah um i'm sure you can name a thousand but is there any like one particular like song or soundtrack from Cobra Kai that you just remember like was the biggest challenge? And like, can you talk about that? Oh yeah. Okay. Well, the, it wasn't a song, but it was score. So the big duel, the big karate match at the outside dojo, uh, Johnny and Daniel. Mm. Oh, in season four like yeah. with the rematch oh okay exactly that was really difficult the reason is um it was it was a very elaborate process so they gave me the scene dry which means no music i just had it's also very interesting because i don't know if you know this the original fight in karate kid used to have score yeah and then they removed it and it's no music and it's really cool Well, this was kind of, this reminded me of that because I I got it and there was no music. And I was like, whoa, okay, I'm going (laughs) to add some music to this now. So what I did and uh, is remember, of course you do remember. You're you're the biggest biggest fan, you know, like one minute, one minute and second. That's funny. So that, that, uh, that, that moment where, um, Daniel is extremely mad and he goes looking for, for Sam and, uh, the, Daniel and Johnny fight in the apartment oh, yeah, yeah. and they bring the TV down and you have flashbacks to the tournament. So that piece of music there, uh, I remember that moment because it's like, okay, confrontation between Danny, Daniel and, and Johnny. So I grabbed that piece and I grabbed some of, uh, the chosen, uh, fight, the montage with the pressure points. Those were the things that I, I was thinking of because, of course, Daniel does that move in that fight. And uh, I did some more of like the, the emotional dramatic music for the end with Hawk and the, and the, uh, the shaving. But um, that was kind of my palette. And I tempt the whole thing with those pieces of music, kind of weaving in and out and scoring the fight with temp. And uh, the showrunners gave me some notes. I did some some revisions and then we got it and they loved it and that was and that was it and then Zach and Leo did their own thing which was incredible it was kind of that shape that we established but they took it to 11 with like the with the emotion and with the excitement they made it really exciting and uh I remember then being at the stage and Of course, they gave me this note when it was like a half hour till we were going to wrap. And they said like, hey, we love this, but there's this section here for the pressure points that we just really liked 
how it used to be in the temp. Could we go back to that? So then I was like, oh, shoot, okay. And Wait, I have I'm to, sorry, when you say in the temp, what do you, what do you mean by the that? The temp would be what I established, the temporary music. Okay. So when I, when I cut all those things, it was kind of a blueprint, a roadmap for Zach and Leo to do their own original thing, somewhat considering, somewhat or, or, or a lot, depending on the scene, considering what I had done with notes and feedback from the, from the showrunners, they did their own thing. But the chosen section, the pressure points, was different enough that the that the showrunners wanted what we had done previously. So they didn't want the original music. They wanted the, by original, I mean the new music, but they yeah. wanted the one that was scored for from the chosen section. Like they wanted it verbatim, like literally that piece there. So I had to do a very difficult edit where I had to listen to the to the music prior, during, and after. Figure out what the timing was, and do something called pitch and time elastic audio to match the tempo of the music prior and after, so that we would go seamlessly, and also do like a pitch shifting so that the keys would match, so that we go from the new piece of music and then going into the temporary music which they wanted to keep for that chosen section and then back out for more of the new music and i had to do that with like a time limit of like 20 minutes so that they had ch a, a chance to review it and see if they like it and approve it and then mix it in that was really tough but it worked out um wow when when you have really smart showrunners like these guys they know exactly what they want. So it makes my job a little bit easier than if they just had said, you know, that over there, that section, I, we just don't like it. Can you give us something else? That would be even more difficult. That would be like a step up in, in, in challenge. Here, at least they said, we like this and we want that back there like we had it. But it was then up to me to find out how to do it seamlessly so you can't tell that it's, New music, old music, new music. And if you listen to it, you would be able to tell, since you're a fan, you'll be able to see how it's exactly the same piece of music yeah. for a section, and then you go to new music. Yeah, and, it, and it's really interesting um, for everyone out there, just a little fun tidbit. The, uh, the soundtrack on the, um, the score, like on Apple Music or Spotify, wherever you listen to, has the the original or the the it has the other soundtrack yeah. and yeah. that really caught me off guard and i was like okay so that was originally what would what it was gonna be right exactly that's what it what it would have been prior to the uh the notes from the showrunners like at the last moment before we could we didn't have a chance to change anything they were like you know what i think we like the other stuff so i have to go and change it so yeah, if you wanted to get the the piece of music as it appeared on the show, it's impossible. You would have to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> well, props off to you because that you know, I, I I love how you brought up that scene, and you know, I've uh, obviously I'm no music editor, but you know, I've edited like my own like short films, and I've put music over it, and yeah, yeah, like like basically what you're saying is you had to put music that was not even composed yeah. with that song in the same key or tempo or all that. And you had to seamlessly incorporate it. And I've watched that scene like a million times and it, it, it flows so perfect and it's thank brilliant. You, man. So yeah, a great job. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. I mean, I could like, I, I, I literally could like talk to you forever about this. I would love to just like, you know, one day we could break down every step. <laughs> you know, if you have like, like yeah. 50 hours, we could just break down every single episode of the show. <laughs> so funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, Andres, I just want to thank you so, so much for, um, for joining me today. Like, congratulations. Welcome, on thank you for having me. It, it, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, of course. It, literally, my pleasure. Congratulations on everything. Uh, Cobra Kai, Obliterated, um, the Weird Al movie, um, Twist and Metal. Oh my God! I like so much. Yeah. I, I you have so many projects. Um, would love to have you back on. Um, 
maybe even after obliterated. So sure. you can yeah, tell us those cool. spoilers. We'll be able to talk about it finally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we wrap up, uh, where can the fans uh, follow you and uh, keep up with what you're doing? Sure. I mean, I have a website. You can go there. It's just uh, myname.com, I think. So it's uh, A-N-D-R-E-S-L-O-C-S-E-Y.com. Uh, I think that's what it is. Let me make sure I'm not making it up. <laughs> and um, I'll link it in the description below so everyone can... Uh, yeah, you can see that. You can also go to my IMDb page. Uh, something else that I recommend for people to watch that I did uh, not too long ago, somewhat, somewhat a bit of a time ago. Let's see. It's called Maya and the Three. This wasn't with uh, with uh, Zach and Leo. Mm -hmm. It was with uh, Tim Davies and Gustavo Santolaya, the uh, composer from Argentina. Um, and that's a really cool show, too. I recommend it. It's about a, an Aztec princess, and it's an animation. It's really cool. Awesome. Where can people check that out? That's on Netflix too. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. And is there anything you'd like to say to the the fans of Cobra Kai watching right now? Uh, thank you for your support. We love the fans and uh, we can't wait you to see the next and final season. That's going to be super cool. So excited. It's going to be great. Well, Andres, thank you so thank much. You and thank you, everybody, for watching. We will see you next time on Cobra Kai Kid. And until then, do you want to take us out with the line, Cobra Kai never dies? Cobra Kai never dies. <laughs> <laughs>